welcome to another Agile IT Brown Bag. I'm your host, Sean Spicer. Normally, you know me from our Agile IT Tech Talks, but Brown Bags are typically sessions we do internally to share knowledge amongst our team. Topics can range from how to configure WBD post pools to how to properly communicate. Now, I've occasionally broken out mine to turn into Tech Talks, but I'm breaking a few out and keeping the brown bag nomenclature to differentiate from our normal technical content. Today, I am happy to officially announce that Agile IT is a CMMC registered provider organization. After years of helping organizations meet requirements like NIST 800-171 and migrating to managing GCC High, it feels good to be recognized for all that effort. So today, we're going to talk about the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification and how that fits into GCC High. So yesterday, I uploaded another brown bag session on the history of federal cybersecurity regulations. It was a pretty deep dive, working through nearly 200 years of cybersecurity regulations. If you want to know how there are cybersecurity regs that old, you'll have to watch that one. So let's look at how we got to CMMC. First, we have the federal acquisition regulations. Then. FAR came about in 1979 as an attempt to streamline government acquisitions. Part of FAR is a set of mandatory clauses that must exist in every federal contract. The FAR includes 15 safeguarding requirements for federal contract information. Now, every cabinet level agency and department buys things differently and create, they can create their own supplements to the federal acquisition regulations. For the DOD, this is DFARS, the Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplement, which came about in 2010. It's important to know that DFARS adds on to the FAR and does not replace it. However, on December 21st, 2017, DFARS Clause 252.204-7012, and I'm going to just call that DFARS 7012 moving on, that came into effect. And this required compliance with NIST 800-171 along with a couple of other controls, in order to protect controlled unclassified information. The problem with both of these is that there is no certifying body, and the government just has to trust that contractors are actually reading their contracts and that they're following the rules that are in them. And contractors show their compliance with system security plans and plans of actions and mitigations. Some people call it plan of action and milestones. So SSPs and POEMs. The SSP says what is working and what is in place, and the POAM is an outline of how the organization plans to reach full compliance. The problem is that many contractors don't even have those, and of those that do, many wrote them in response to DFAR 7012 a couple of years ago when that went into effect, and they haven't touched them since. This opens them up to lawsuits under the False Claims Act. The False Claims Act dates all the way back to the Civil War, but has gained a lot of power since the 1980s. The FCA is meant to prevent contractors from defrauding the government. It's unusual since it lets individuals sue companies on behalf of the government and then get a portion of the damages. In 2019, the DOJ, Department of Justice, obtained over $3 billion in FCA settlements, including an $8.6 million settlement for Cisco for undisclosed cybersecurity vulnerabilities. It obviously isn't working. So after much industry discussion, the first draft of CMMC was made public in 2019 with version one of the document being published officially in January, 2020. DFARS 7021 was released and went into effect on November 30th. This set out a timeline for CMMC to be rolled out over the coming five years. And for the first time, cybersecurity would require a third-party assessment. However, it also added the immediate requirement that contractors perform a self-assessment against the 110 controls in NIST 800-171 and submit it to the DOD's Supplier Performance Risk System prior to renewing or being awarded any new contracts. So let's look at what that CMMC rollout looks like. So in fiscal year 21, we're going to see 15 new contracts with CMMC language, which will affect an estimated 1,500 contractors. In fiscal year 2022, we see 75 more contracts with CMMC language, and that is affecting an additional 7,500 contractors. It also includes the first level four and level five requirements. In 2023, 
that number of new prime contracts jumps to 750 was 25,000 new affected contractors. It's important to know that this is part of what the CMMC AB calls their crawl, walk, and run approach, is it will take time to have enough assessors and provider organizations to meet the demand of 25,000 organizations all requiring assessments in one year. In 2024, we see that jump where there's now 479 prime contracts and adding over 47,000 new certified contractors. And in 2025, we see it stabilize. And by this time, the first year's contractors are going to be coming up for reassessment. And this is where it becomes sustainable. And finally, in 2026, all DOD contracts will contain CMMC requirements. Now, before we get into the different levels of CMMC, I want to talk about the defense supply chain. So in this example, we're gonna look at an airplane. And making an airplane is complicated. The F-35 program alone has nearly 1,900 contractors in 45 states, accounting for over 254,000 jobs. Electronics, cables, bolts, glass, gears, paint, manuals, training, weapon systems are all produced under a massive web of contracts, subcontracts, purchase orders, and off-the-shelf purchases. The worldwide industrial complex that enables research and development, as well as the design, delivery, and maintenance of military hardware and software is known as the Defense Industrial Base, or DIB. But the Defense Department buys more than weapons. Janitorial services, food, phones, network access, construction, office supplies, carpet, professional services are also all required. These suppliers are known as the Defense Supply Chain, or DSC. Now stop and imagine how much information this complex web contains and think about how valuable that information is. Let's give an example. Here's a picture of the US F-22 and the Chinese J-20 fighter planes. Here's the US Apache versus the Chinese Thunderbolt and the M1 Abrams and the ZTZ-99. So within this web of contracts, we have different types of information. Federal contract information is primarily around the defense supply chain, the people that are providing food and janitorial services. And this is the official definition. But what I want you to take away from this is that it is information not intended for public release. Now, then there's controlled unclassified information. And the definition's a little bit more long-winded, but the thing to remember here is that it's information that the government creates or that an entity creates for or on behalf of the government that is subject to being handled with safeguards and dissemination controls. And it does not include classified information. So if you work in the defense industrial base, this is probably stuff you're familiar with. But I wanna talk about the way that prime and subcontractor information flows can go. And I'm gonna be a little bit silly. So let's say the government wants to build a chicken guided missile. Primeco gets the main contract, and because it is certified at maturity level three, they can work with the government on CUI and FCI. Their subcontractor, Bird Bombs, is also maturity level three, and they share the plans and specs with them. Bolts Inc., a smaller subcontractor, is only maturity level one, so they can't have access to the plans and specifications of the chicken bobber, but they can access the FCI. Meanwhile, in order to get enough chickens for the project, Primeco chooses Chickens Inc. as their supplier. Chickens Inc. is normally not in the defense supply chain. They're not a defense contractor. They have no certification and they're considered COTS, commercial off the shelf. Primeco can still do business with them by removing the federal contract information from the equation and ordering with a purchase order. So, there's a lot of different types of information here. There's a very simplified example, but don't laugh too hard because during World War II, the military did work on creating a pigeon guided missile. So let's look at the CMMC practices and processes. CMMC level one will be the most common and it's focused on protecting federal contract information. It has 17 practices and no processes since if it focused 
since it is focused on the performance of cybersecurity best practices. Just get it done. Level two is a transition level, and one I suspect will not be seen too much, as it is only in place as a transitory uh, level. And as the CMMC AB says, it's to recognize the performance of contractors as they do the work to move to level three. It, it jumps from 17 practices to 72 practices and has the first two processes in the maturity model. Levels three through five are gonna be required for managing controlled unclassified information. Level three is going to be the most common with around 50,000 contractors required to meet its requirements. It has 130 practices, including all 110 from NIST 800-171. Levels four and five are gonna be reserved for the biggest and most targeted primes with only a combined 144 total companies expected to be required to meet these two levels. So let's look at where GCC High fits into this and look at that layout again. So for protecting federal contract information, you'll be able to meet level one and two in Microsoft Commercial. For meeting CMMC levels three, four, and five, you're going to need commercial. That's right. There's nothing in CMMC that requires GCC high. This is great for scalability and expansion as CMMC is gradually going to be adopted by other industries and agencies outside of the def Defense Department. But the thing to remember is that CMMC is mandated by DFAR 7021, which builds on and does not replace DFAR 7012. So for defense contractors meeting CMMC level three and defending controlled unclassified information, and also those with uh, CUI with a higher watermark like ITAR, you're still going to need GCC high. So this is a common question that comes up. I think I answer this about five times a day when the phone rings. You do need GCC high to meet CMMC level three and higher if you are defending CUI as defined in DFARS 7012 and 7021. And that is CMMC and GCC high in a nutshell. We can go a lot deeper. There are a lot of really big examples, a lot of complicated things about scoping. I will be doing more talks in the future about the domains, the controls, the processes, scoping, and really excited about where we are going with this new cybersecurity certification. So thanks for watching. Give us a like and follow. If you do have any questions or suggestions about things that I could talk in more depth about, put them down in the comments section down below. I love answering them. But for right now, thank you very much and have a great day.